good to see you all. Uh, today, we're going to be looking at the scripture that was just read for us in Matthew 16. And what I was hearing as I was reading through the scripture, as well as just hearing the news, is I believe that this scripture gives us some key insights in how we as Christians live through difficult times, trouble, even persecution. I'm not if you're sure how much of the news you've been following, but uh, the ISIS uh, resurrection, I guess, or movement that's going on in the Middle East has brought about an incredible persecution of Christians in that area. The Kurdish Christians, we hear about this little group of people out there, but essentially it, many watchdog agencies have called this a bit of a Christian genocide that has been going on. The city of Mosul, which was a huge Christian uh, pilgrimage site uh, just across the river from the place of Nineveh. You've all heard that place where Jonah got spit up by a whale, right? <laughs> but this is the place uh, where there's a holy site for Christians, and uh, it was said that right before ISIS came and took over that city, that they had set an ultimatum to convert to Islam or die. And many of the Christians fled into the whole side. Up to this point, it's uh, estimated there's over 100,000 Christians who've been displaced, either killed or just are no longer at home where the safety is. So as we hear the news, as we hear the various uh, troubles around us, how do we as Christians make sense of persecution? And maybe not even at such a large scale, but even in a smaller scale of our own lives, recognizing that we all suffer sickness, disease, struggle. We don't, you know, we have troubles with our uh, workers, co-workers, our friends, and our neighbors because of our faith. How do we make sense of that? It does seem that somehow our Christian culture in America would want to promise you that if you believe the right things, everything is going to go well for you. That this is somehow a bed of roses. That you know, if you believe in Jesus, then you're going to have a nice happy home, a little piece of the American pie, and that's what it's all about. And somehow, if you don't have everything all right for you, that somehow there's something wrong with your faith system. And there's so many different faith systems out there that are going to tell you that if you just believe, it's all going to work out. Well, today's scripture goes completely against that. Jesus tells Peter that he is on his way to Jerusalem. And that when he gets there, he is going to suffer and be persecuted and be uh, handed over to death. Now that is completely opposite of what Peter had expected to happen for Jesus. And I wonder how we deal with that as Christians. Well, we recognize that Jesus' message is not that we are supposed to enjoy the happy, go-lucky life, but that there are going to be times that we're going to encounter difficulty and suffering. And more than that, that it's actually part of God's intentional plan for your life that you will have to go through times of suffering. That is the Christian message. That there is actually part of God's will and plan that we are going to go through that suffering. If God had planned for Jesus to go to the cross and die, we cannot expect that as his followers of Jesus Christ, that we are going to not experience any kind of suffering, difficulty, or trouble in our lives. It just doesn't make sense. And so when we make sense of this, how do we understand how we're supposed to live through these difficult times, these sufferings? And so as I want us to point out some of the key pieces of the scripture to help us understand. And really the first part that I want to camp out on is that it starts with saying, from that time, Jesus began to explain to his disciples what he must go and do in Jerusalem. Now, what the there is for, what's happening then, is that Peter has just declared that Jesus is the Messiah, the Son of God. And the disciples together all acclaimed and believed together, affirmed that truth that in Jesus he had found the Messiah, the one who is anointed by God, who is going to be the political ruler for Jerusalem and Israel and for their people. They had affirmed this together. They got it. They saw Jesus do his miracles, his healing. They see Jesus do incredible things, and his teaching was profound. They said, yes, we will follow you anywhere. You are the Messiah. I think the spiritual truth here is that God does not reveal to us the next step until somehow we've got or grasped hold of the truth that he has for us right now. Now, that piece of suffering, Jesus already knew. He knew that ultimately he would be going to Jerusalem to die. He knew that that was part of the plan. But he had not revealed that to the disciples until they had affirmed something that they finally understood of who Jesus was. 
He had already spent a year or two with the disciples, walking with them along the paths and doing amazing things. Peter had already fallen into the water and called out, Savior, save me. And Jesus reached out his hand and grabbed him. And it was only then, after Peter has affirmed what he understands and grabbed what is being revealed to him of who Jesus is, that Jesus then opens up what the next step is. What he's supposed to be doing next. Now, I know in my life I would really prefer that God might give me some sort of road map. You know, that I'm supposed to do this for four years, I'm supposed to be in one place, I'm supposed to get to know these people, to do these things, and then do the next thing. But that's not the way God works. Unfortunately, I would so much love to have it just all revealed. But I think there's some truth to why God does that. And, and I think there's a few things we should learn through that. He doesn't show us the road, but only the next few steps. And I think one of the first things we learn about that is that it teaches us to trust Him. God wants us to know and trust Him. It's all about this relationship. God wants us to know that we can trust who God is in the midst of our life. Whether there's a difficult thing going on or some happy occasion, but everything in our life, we need to be able to trust God, that our direction and our paths in life are something we can trust Him with. I know that for me, there are times where I say, yes, Lord, I trust you, but there's a lot of areas in my life I don't want to trust you. I really want to do my own thing. And there might be times where I trust God, and then a few days later, I'm like, well, yeah, that was a good idea then, <laughs> but I've got something better in mind. We'll just see. And of course, the way that seems to work out is that that's sort of a detour. And I find myself a year later going, oops, i got to go back to square one, where I was trusting God. And he's helping me walk through the steps of life. That's what it's about. God wants us to learn how to trust Him. In the Proverbs, uh, Solomon had put it this way. He said, Trust in the Lord with all your heart, and lean not on your own understanding. In all your ways, submit to Him, and He will guide your steps. Trust Him with all your heart, not leaning on your own understanding. As part of our journey of life is to learn that the God who created us, the one who has formed us in His image and is walking with us, wants us to know who He is and that we can trust Him with our lives. That's not always easy. It's not always easy because we'd rather trust ourselves or trust others or trust the good opinions that seem to be thrown at us without even being asked sometimes. Right? We are being asked to trust Him. Second thing I think we, we learn through this experience is that God wants us to be faithful with the tasks that are in front of us. Be faithful with that little piece that He's given you to do right now. There's time and time again where it seems like that little menial task just seems to be unimportant. Like I'll do everything else instead of that one thing that God has given us to do. And it's natural for us to want to pick and choose what we'd like to do. But the truth is, we don't really know what's even best for ourselves. We don't really know those tasks that we have to get done in order to be better and grow as people. We tend to want to choose those things that are easiest. We avoid those areas that cause the deepest pain in our lives. You know those memories that you've tucked way away that you'd kind of rather not unlock and deal with? You know, talk about suffering. Sometimes the worst psychological suffering is having to deal with your past. You work through that stuff. God wants us to be able to take the next step of the journey of our lives with Him, but He wants us to work through the stuff that's right in front of us. And that by going through that, we demonstrate faithfulness. He wants to know if you are somebody He can trust with the tasks that He wants to give you. So it's first about trusting God and developing that relationship, and secondly, whether or not, and then us knowing God is trustworthy. But there's another part of that is whether we're trustworthy with what God has given us. Are we being faithful with what God has put in front of us? I think thirdly, we recognize that there is an experience of this relationship where we learn something about God in our trials that is helpful in understanding what that next piece is about. We see that directly in the scripture here where Peter has acknowledged that Jesus is the Messiah. They, he's seen Jesus walking on water. He's seen Jesus heal the dead. He's seen Jesus feed the masses. And now Jesus is saying, are you willing to trust me when we finally get to persecution? If you're willing to see how awesome things are when things are going well, are you willing to trust me in the tough times? When finally I'm being flogged and you're all, you know, not sure if you want to still acknowledge who I am, are you willing to trust me as the Messiah then? We also see some other examples in Scripture. Abraham. 
He was being asked to be faithful with, he, with what he had in presenting his son as a sacrifice. And if he had not been faithful with that, he would not have known God to be the provider, the one who provides, Jehovah Jireh, the one who gives. Moses would not have known God as the one who is almighty, except that he was faithful in lifting up that staff and saying to the waters to be parted. And seeing the power of God working through that. It might seem a simple thing to raise his staff over the water, but if he had never done it, he would have never known who God was as the mighty one, the Savior of his people. So for us, how do we come to know God? How do we learn who God is? Who is it that God is wanting you to know Him as so that we might trust Him with that and learn who He is? There are over a hundred names for God in Scripture. Each of them is an invitation for us to know something of the character of God. Jesus often prays to God as loving Father. To know God as a loving parent. Maybe to know God as our forgiver. The one who has forgiven us of our sin. Who has taken our sin and put it as far away as the east is from the west. Can we know Him and trust Him? So that as we move in our lives, we know the depth, the depth of God's love so much that we're able to live lives of powerful overcoming in our lives. So those three pieces, I think, are important for us to recognize why God only shows us one step at a time. And that is He helps us to learn to trust Him. It helps them to stay faithless for ourselves. And also, to help us experience that relationship of understanding something of who God is in the midst of our lives. Next, we see Peter, you know, taking Jesus aside and telling him, Never, Lord, that's not going to happen. You, you don't have to go to Jerusalem. And what's interesting, of course, what Peter is sharing with Jesus is what he thinks is his messianic plan, as Peter has read it in Scripture. He is telling Jesus what he knows of what the Messiah is supposed to do. He says, no, no, see... What you're supposed to do, Jesus, is not go to Jerusalem to die. You're supposed to raise up a special army and then take over the Romans and you know, reset up a new uh, governing system here in Israel. And that's what you're supposed to do, Jesus. Somehow we kind of think we have the right to tell God what God's plan is, right? That gets us into all kinds of trouble when we start flipping the coin of who's really God in our lives. There's this bumper sticker that says, you know, God is God and you are not. Yeah, that's so true. You know, if we can finally get a hold of that reality. But Peter has in his mind what he thinks his plan is for life. And Jesus has to sternly tell him, no, that's not the plan that I have for you. Jesus' revelation that God's plan for the kingdom of God includes suffering and death is completely contrary to what Peter's expectation is for God's plan. You know, as I was just talking about earlier, we do somehow expect that the Christian life, or by believing the right things, that everything's supposed to go hunky-dory. It's all supposed to be good. But to know that the kingdom of God, that there is indeed suffering, a part of the picture, it might be something that's contrary to what we might understand and what that's about. And honestly, I think we would rather that there be some other option. You know, it would have been great if somehow, instead of Jesus going to Jerusalem, he just somehow said, okay, you all believe, bam, we're all in heaven, it's all done. You know, that would have been great. Or somehow, you know, the, the flood of angel armies like comes in and takes care of it, and now we live in, you know, heavenly realms. It's fantastic. That's not the way it works. It's just not the way it works. So, we have to come to grips with the fact that we serve a God who has chosen a path of suffering for himself as well as for those who would follow. Let's take a hold of that. We have chosen to believe in a God who has chosen a path to suffer both for himself and those who would believe. That might just be really jar your theology a little bit. But there are a lot of different ways that God could have saved the world. But God has chosen a path of suffering. So let's see if we can get our mind around that. Why in the world would God have chosen a path of suffering rather than just find some other easy way to go about it? Well, I think first we recognize that God demonstrates that through that suffering, as Jesus was going to the cross and humanity rejected him, the reason humanity was rejecting him was they finally saw the truth of God's love being revealed to them. And it was humanity that was rejecting this demonstration. So as Jesus goes to the cross and he hangs there on the cross, what's being exposed is both God's love and human sin. 
The human rejection of God is fully exposed. If God had chosen some other method to save humanity, we would not have had to come to grips with the mirror image of our own fallenness, of our own sin, our own rejection of God, our own depravity, and the fact that we are not willing to embrace the truth of who God is. When God comes in human form and walks with us and saves many and heals many, we respond as humanity by putting Him on the cross and considering Him scorned beaten, and despised. The difference of who God is as the holy and loving God is completely different than humanity. And it is through Jesus demonstrating what that means to live that life of loving suffering that we see that reflected honestly before us. Now that honest truth is hard for us to swallow. But until we recognize that there is really something wrong with us as humanity, that there is something deeply sinful that needs to be cleaned up, we're going to continue to walk in this rose-colored glasses of the world and not deal with the stuff we've got to deal with. God chose the way of suffering to show humanity, to hold up a mirror to humanity and say, there's some stuff we've got to work with, folks. We've got to clean up house a little bit before we can take the next steps together. That's hard. I don't know if you've ever had a friend who lovingly shared with you how you screwed up. <laughs> you know, lovingly shared with you sometimes is hard to take, right? But that's hard for us to deal with. But it, this is where God's love and His truth and honesty come together because God not only exposed our sin at the cross, but through the work of His suffering on the cross, He also demonstrates the abundance of His love. He says, I know that you as humanity are going to reject me. I know as humanity there's something wrong, but I'm going to show you that I'm going to give you everything that I am and everything that I have. So you will know that there is nothing you could possibly do that's going to separate you from my love. That I'm going to continue to come after you. That I'm going to continue to show you how much I care about you, no matter how much you reject me, no matter how many times you turn and disobey me and continue to deny me in your lives, I'm going to pour out everything so that I will not lose you. God has chosen to love us. And that is demonstrated most fully by recognizing that God has chosen this way of suffering. And it is through that suffering that we acknowledge both our sin and God's love. But He has also demonstrated through that that He is a God of power who overcomes all things in this world, that Jesus Christ even descended to the dead so that there would be no one who could escape the power of His love. And on the third day, He rose from the dead. This demonstrates that God conquers all. In Jesus' life, He demonstrated power over sickness. He demonstrated power over nature. He demonstrated power over demons. And finally, at the end, at the cross, He demonstrated power over death. Only through suffering would that have been revealed to us? That through suffering, we see the power of God to overcome. Now hopefully, those pieces then help us to understand a little bit what that means for us. That if we also follow a God who's chosen a way of suffering, of how that is going to impact the way we live. Because we also suffer. How do we respond in the midst of our suffering? How is it, what is God wanting us to know about how we deal with suffering in our own lives. And of course, the main truth is that we can recognize that we serve a God who has overcome. A God who, no matter how big our trials might be, there is a God who is bigger. God is bigger than your troubles. No matter what it is. Whether it's to be a bad hair day, an unemployment job, or being in a place where you're being persecuted and even killed, we know that God is even bigger than death, and that there's nothing and nowhere we can go that God's love will not rescue us. And God's hand is there to save. And we can trust Him with every aspect of our lives, because there is now no aspect of any life that is beyond God's loving hands, that are beyond His control. And we can trust Him with that. The other thing we recognize is that there is something that happens to us when we struggle. Time and time and through James, it describes it this way, that suffering brings about good character. That suffering somehow changes us in some powerful ways in which we become better people. You actually get to rise to the occasion. 
Because of suffering, rather than sitting on a lounge chair in a lazy boy sitting with a you know, nice soda, soda watching TV all the time, but the, you know, there's something that changes us when we go through times of suffering. That we develop personality and character reflecting what God wants to see happen in us. What's interesting is we look at the fruit of the Spirit, love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, all of those require there to be some other person or some other occasion in which that can be demonstrated. I don't know if you've ever tried to be loving in a vacuum or all by yourself. I think there's some rules about not doing that. But I mean, there's, there's this reality that there has to be some object of your affection. In order for love to be demonstrated, there has to be someone who you give to or that you are demonstrating sacrificial love to. Peace requires that there is at least another party who is in peace with you. Gentleness, kindness require that there's some other party about that. Now, how do we grow in our spiritual fruit as people of God? It is through times in which we are being challenged to grow beyond where we have been. And if we shrink from that challenge, we never grow to demonstrate the fruit of the character that God wants to develop within us. And the Spirit of God is so hungry and jealous for that fruit to come about in us that He will not let us go until that fruit becomes bare, until it comes out, until it's available, ripe, and ready in our lives. God does not let us just sit alone on our own, stoop and, and wonder how life is going to work, but He is challenging us through times of suffering to bring about that fruit. Now there's this story about trying to alleviate suffering because as we see the butterfly in its chrysalis form, it takes a long time for that butterfly to come out of the cocoon. There's a lot of struggling and moving about. And it has been said that sometimes if a scientist wanted to you know, clip that cocoon so that it would be easier for that moth or the butterfly to come out of the cocoon, it's never going to fly. It's never going to grow the strength in its wings to be able to fly. Same thing is true for our spiritual lives. If we've never experienced suffering, if we've never been challenged in our spiritual lives, we'll never grow the wings to grow and to fly and to do with strength the things that God has asked us to do and to be the people of God. And so there is a purpose for suffering in our lives. It brings about integrity and character in our lives. And we grow out of those safety zones that we surround ourselves with and finally into the community of Christ and learning to live in trust of God with all that God is calling us to be. This message is about getting some perspective, I think, on the suffering and struggles we have in our lives. And sometimes, like children, we whine and cry because things aren't going our way. But there, God's hand is gently, like a loving parent, guiding us. Guiding us step by step, helping us to grow and to walk. Now, in this last thing I want to share with you is that Jesus shares with Peter that he does not have in his mind the things of God, but his mind is consumed with the things of this world. And I know it's very easy for us to get consumed by the things of this world, and we, when we look to other things, instead of looking to God first, we, we recognize that we need to look to God first for God's perspective, rather than looking to the world and for human perspectives on our lives. But it's so easy for us to get our minds surrounded by human opinion about what our lives should be about. I mean, just turn on the TV and late night they'll give you all sorts of solutions that you didn't ever knew you had, right? And somehow knew that pouring you know, milk into a glass was so difficult, you need this special funnel. I mean, there's all sorts of things that you know, the world wants to sell you of advice of how you're supposed to live. And Peter has been into the advice and the, the world thought that somehow this Messiah is supposed to take it all away and somehow make life better for us. But Jesus has a different plan. How do we get our minds focused on what God wants? How do we allow for our minds to be so saturated with the truths of God that the things of this world seem to disappear or seem to not have as much sway or control over our lives? Because ultimately we want God to be the one in control of our lives and not ourselves or other people to be in control of our lives. Well, I, I would suggest that we, we need to allow ourselves to really get saturated into God's Word. Allow yourselves to get into reading the Scriptures. Allow for your mind to meditate on the Word. King David said, I meditate on your Word day and night because I do not want to offend you, Lord. Allow our minds to meditate on God. Maybe to allow ourselves a time of prayer, listening to God. 
all the various ways we might grow deeply in our spiritual life, which is going to be the focus of our series starting next Sunday. Really getting into it. How is it that we allow for the Word of God, the love of God, the will of God to be so part of our lives that we find it just ebbing out of who we are? What's interesting is, even in Jesus' day, that the religious know-it-alls seemed to think they had it all together. But Jesus had a different plan. Finally, we hear this catchphrase. It says, Jesus, whoever wants to be my disciple must deny themselves and take up their cross and follow me. I think of all of Jesus' sayings, that's one that takes you back, takes you a moment to swallow. What is it that Jesus is really meaning? Now, when Jesus is saying, pick up your cross and follow me, he's not talking about the, the jewel-encrusted gold cross we sometimes wear around our necks. That's not the cross he was talking about. The cross in Jesus' day was a cross that was bore by people who were on criminals, who had gone through trial, who were to carry their cross to the place that they were to be crucified. The Romans had invented the crucifixion to be the most torturous way of killing someone that you could possibly imagine. And they did that so that they could not only kill the person, but also to humiliate them and to intimidate the populace so that they might conform them to do their will. The cross is a way of suffering. It's a way of shame. It's a way of isolation to point out where this person is different than everybody else. And Jesus is saying, if you want to be my disciple, you need to be willing to pick up a cross. You need to be willing to endure the suffering and shame and scorn of the world who's going to see you acting and living in a way that's different than they are. You're going to have to want, to, uh, want the priority of who God is in your life more than the things of this world. And to be able to endure that kind of shame and humiliation. Who daily, as they make their way to the place of their own crucifixion, the crowds might throw things at them, might spit on them, might declare them to be worthless. Jesus says, pick up that cross and follow me. Follow me. That may lead us to points of our lives where we actually have to give up our own lives for the sake of the gospel. But Jesus says that unless you are willing to deny yourself and pick up the cross and follow me, I have nothing to do with you. You must be willing to endure knowing that nothing else in the world matters except for the love of God and the fact that He has you in His hands. There's no way you can go that He has not been control. And Jesus has promised that we can never be lost when we are found in Him. Whoever wants to save their life will lose it, but whoever will lose their sake, your life for my sake will find it. Jesus is describing to the disciples that even if we were to die, no matter what you have lost in this life, no matter what you have given up to follow me, you will have not lost that if it is found in me. You will never be lost or forsaken. So as we hear these words, we recognize that although the world might tell us, that if you just believe the right things, things are supposed to work out. The message of Jesus is a much deeper note. A much deeper note about living an honest life before God. A life that inquires and entails suffering and how we live through that suffering with honesty, with faithfulness, and trusting in Him. Just think about our own lives for a moment. We recognize that there's stuff that we're all dealing with, right? There's stuff we, we deal with that's tough, there's decisions we all have to make as to whether or not we're going to trust God, we're going to follow Him, or we're going to you know, trust other people. Today, as you, you hear these words, I want to invite you to put those things into God's hands. Say, Lord, I know things are a mess. I know there's some stuff I'm dealing with, but I want your perspective. I want to know who you are in the midst of my life. And because of who, your love is, or who you are and your love for me, I invite you to, to help me understand your presence to walk with you through this. Let's do that as a church. Let's pray. God, this morning as we come before you, we hear the words of Jesus. What a shock it is sometimes for us to recognize that your instruction, your life here was one of suffering and pain and rejection. And you invite the disciples, and even us who are here, to experience that with you. We recognize and we admit, God, that we would prefer to have the easy life. We would prefer to have an easy faith system that makes everything okay. But God, as we trust you and we hear the words of Jesus, 
Or let it help us to put our faith in you. We think about the stuff we're dealing with, the struggles in our lives, the pain that we're dealing with, our grief. Help us to place this in your hands. Help us to hear your voice and your comfort with us as we walk with you. And ultimately, Lord, that we might know that we are yours. And yours alone. And this in Jesus Christ, our Lord and Savior. Amen.